Um, thanks for having me. I'm going to talk about something incredibly boring, which means I'm going to try to make it a little bit exciting. A little bit exciting. The idea of you know coming out here and trying to get people excited about metrics um, on a Tuesday morning when you could be on the beach playing volleyball is is kind of difficult. But um, that's that's what I'm talking about. I've been talking about metrics pretty much all of 2015. I think that's all the talks that I've done. And, and there's, there's two reasons for that. One is that security practitioners really need to understand the value of metrics and how they can be used to communicate. And two, I'm just absolutely sick to death of talking about endpoint security. Uh, talking about endpoint security is absolutely horrible. I, I figure it's gotta be kind of like, you know, um, being a, a thoracic surgeon or whatever, and getting people coming in there, they, they, they're eating a they're eating a gigantic porterhouse steak and smoking a cigar, and they go, "I'm getting chest pains, doctor. What should I do?" And you go, "Don't eat so much red meat and don't smoke." And they go, "Oh, what's Plan B?" That is endpoint security in a nutshell. We can do all kinds of things to make our endpoints secure. It's just they're inconvenient. Um, and actually, this question of what is inconvenient versus what is convenient is really critical to the whole topic of metrics. You see that nice little segue I tried to throw there? Um, but, but frequently, when you're talking to management, you need to be able to explain why you want to do something as opposed to not doing something or opposed to doing something else. And very, very frequently, I see security practitioners or I run into people who go, you know, I don't know how to talk to the business units. This is how you talk to the business units, right? I'm not here as a Robert McNamara-esque metrics wonk who's saying we need to have the security equivalent of body counts, which is kind of where we're stuck right now, right? Um, you know, when you, when you read the media about computer security, the media seems to think that how many records were stolen in a breach is an interesting metric, an interesting unit of measurement of how bad a security disaster is. Now, if you think about that quietly for just a couple seconds, you're going to realize it's a completely useless piece of information. Right? And that's really part of the problem. People don't think about this problem of metrics very effectively. And this, you know, Lord Kelvin, uh, John Thompson used to say, to measure is to know. And so one of the questions that I like to think about is what is the unit of measurement that you, that you keep your security knowledge in? It's, it's a unit of measurement. In fact, if you, if, you, if you remember nothing from this talk except for to seek for your particular unit of measurement, um, that's probably really the key. What is your unit of measurement? I don't know. It's going to be very specific to you, and it's going to be specific to what it is that you do. If you're responsible for breach response, I suspect that your unit of measurement is going to be something to do with breaches, right? Responses, maybe response time, response cost, level of effort around response. I don't know, right? But if I can sit here not, ha not having really any understanding of your specific problem, and just kind of rattle off a couple of those. You can too. All right. So let's get let's get into it, and we'll come. We'll kind of send sort of this is what we're going to talk about. You know, metrics. Why do you want to do this, and so forth. Right. So definitions are crucial as well. Right. Um, uh, Socrates always used to say, "Let's define things and then proceed from there." I'm a big fan of that. Um, this is the definition I like to use. It's a manipulative definition. I constructed it in order to get you to think about a process, and the process is how you're going to produce a metric that's going to be useful. Useful means it's telling some kind of a story. That's how your metric is useful. Right? And that's another place where security practitioners fall down a lot. We go, ah, we're going to get hacked if you do that. And the business unit guys just blow right by us because getting hacked is not a significant unit of measurement to them. But if you tell them, we're going to get penetrated, if you, we're, it's going to increase our likelihood of getting penetrated. I can't tell you how much. But every time we get penetrated, you're going to experience six to eight hours of unexpected downtime. Now you've got their attention, right? I put that into a unit of measure that the business guy is going to understand. So if you work for Acme Widgets and you make widgets, I strongly suspect you're going to want to tell your security story in terms of how the widget production line is going to be affected by that next buffer overrun that the idiot in the cubicle next to you is in the process of getting ready to code, right? Um, and that, that works. So it's a means of reducing some amount of data to tell some kind of story. It's crucial here to be honest. Stories can be manipulative or stories can be true. Stories can be stories can be, you know, good good useful ways of educating somebody or you can tell you can tell a lie. 
Um, I'm a big fan of not telling lies. I find that you can torture people better with the truth than you can by lying. And you can manipulate better with the truth than you can by lying. Because one of the great things is the truth is kind of unassailable. As long as you have the truth on your side, you don't actually have to lie. And that brings up a sub-corollary, which is if you don't have the truth on your side, what's your problem, right? <laughs> you know, what's wrong with you? <laughs> um, um, so, so why are we going to keep metrics? The reason we want to keep metrics is to show for succeeding. Corollary to that is to show for failing. I've never seen it happen yet, but someday, if any of you do this or you know someone who do, does this, let me know because I want to like build a bronze statue to the person. But I want to see someone go to their boss and say, "I've gathered some metrics about our security process, and they indicate that you should probably fire me." I think that would be so badass, right? That, I mean, wouldn't that be great? You know, since I since I took over this position, our security incident rate has gone through the roof, um, and it's my fault. Right. So you actually could see someone say that, and I think that'd be really, really amazing. So you could show that you're failing. That's not such a great thing. Probably our natural inclination, which is called confirmation bias, but our natural inc inclination or survivorship bias, depending on which fa fallacy you like to lean towards. But our natural inclination is to find the truths that are most palatable to ourselves, which means we've already got an inclination to lie. Think about that. I, I want you to think about telling the truth with all of your metrics, and you should understand that you're going to have a natural built-in predilection to lie, so there's no need to go out of your way to tell additional lies or exaggerate. Tell the truth as you see it, because it's probably already self-serving. There's nothing wrong with that. Just acknowledge that and move on, right? Um, <clears throat> why else would we do this? We want to justify our existence. We want to justify our budget. Um, if, you're, if your reason for keeping metrics is you want raw power, this is probably not the right field for you. Um, you might want to argue for change, right? Actually, this is a very good point here. I mean, I just was joking when I said if you want metrics, if, if you want raw power, this isn't the right field for you. If you think about it, these points that I'm making here are the antithesis of raw power. Raw power is having authority. Authority doesn't need to justify itself. Authority doesn't need to explain itself. So when you're the security practitioner in a room full of people, and some of the guys from the business units are proposing to do something stupid, like shortcut the QA cycle on a critical product, right? They're proposing to do something stupid. You're not the authority. Neither are they. They're trying to argue with the authority who's the, the executive in the room who's going to make that actual decision. Um, they don't have to justify themselves. So one of the other things you need to remember when you get into one of these battles of narratives surrounding some sort of thing to do with security, the other person also has to justify themselves. I'm going to kind of get to that later, if I remember. But I always call this the battle of two narratives. You've got, you've got the guys from the business unit who are blowing pink unicorn-colored smoke up someone's backside when they say, if we do this, we're going to make all this money for AcmeWidgets.com. We're going to open whole new lines of widget sales if you only let us ship this buggy piece of crap next week on schedule and not do QA on it. And you have your narrative, your narrative, it, it, now that person is lying. How do you know that they're lying? You know that they're lying because they're basing their projection on some kind of an extrapolation. That's, they're lying. They don't know for sure that that's what's going to happen. So one of the things that you need to do is, one, nail their claims down to the floor and say, okay, so your claim is that, that we're going to make all of this money. That's great. Let's do a review in a year and see if that money has material on it. That's the sound of someone's career ending, right? Um, I, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm interested in morality because I do believe that business and business practices are a moral issue. How you carry on with your coworkers is really an issue that you need to think about very seriously. So I'm going to try to divide between proper ways of arguing and improper ways of arguing. So I'm going to tell you some improper ways of arguing, arguing that are weaponized regularly against you. I suggest you do not go to the dark side and use those techniques, or Darth Vader you will become. But it's good to, it's good to know those sorts of things. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you another one. Um, there's an old saying, which is that uh, uh, success has many parents and uh, failure is an orphan, right? So here's one technique that works very well. Let's say someone in, you're, you're in that meeting and someone proposes to do something incredibly stupid that you think is going to be a disaster. 
So the first thing that you should do is not go, that's incredibly stupid. I think that's going to be a If you're an immoral, bad person, I'm not actually saying do this. Really what you should do is you should grapple with why it's a stupid idea and it's going to be a disaster and explain your facts as clearly and concisely and honestly as you can put them out there. But if you're a nasty person, if you're a complete bastard, what you're going to do, so Joe stands up and says, I think we should move all of our critical customer data to the cloud with no controls on it at all. And you should go, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And then you can screw them up later. But if they succeed, you were their supporter all along from the get-go. And if they failed, you, you, you are now positioned to be the person to identify the inevitable failure and begin to raise the red flags behind their back about it as things go forward. Um, so, so don't ever just jump on something unless you're you know, a, bad, a moral person trying to stop bad things from happening. Okay, so the other reason you want to keep metrics is to argue for change. The best kind of way that you can present a metric, I'm going to give you just off the top, I have to make up examples here, and hopefully I won't make up any of their distasteful or repugnant, but, but that's part of what I have to do. So, you know, let's say we work for Acme Widgets or whatever, um, and what you might do is you might want to say, you know, we've been, we've been monitoring stuff and we had to bring the widget line down three times because of malware in the control system in the last year. Each time we brought the production line because of the malware, so we did that three times. Each time we brought the production line down, it cost us 15,000 widgets manufactured. And you could do the cost-benefit analysis on that. And I think it's not a bad idea to maybe consider doing application whitelisting on the control points that control the widget line. Because if we can take that three to zero, we save that dollar figure that you just computed in your head. That, by the way, is another critical point here. When you're talking to executives, you don't need to compute everything out to dollars. We have this weird thing we do in InfoSec where we want to act as if executives are stupid. They're not stupid. They're malicious, cunning, and evil. They're not stupid. Right? Any executive that you want to talk about can cal calculate to the last decimal place the alternative minimum tax if they exercise their stock options right now and convert that into, into Ferraris without <laughs> blinking. And then, so when you're sitting there going, no, I can't expect that person to memorize a six-digit password, come on. Right? They're gaming you. It's the same trick. I'm going into guy secret land here. I'm sorry, but it's the same trick that every guy has used throughout history to get out of doing the laundry, which is the first time you wife or wash your wife's nice brassieres with your jeans and ruin it. You're off laundry detail forever. Right? It's the same thing that the executives do. They go, I can't remember the password. I'm a complete security dope. And they've just gotten themselves exempted from security forever. Really the answer, if you're a totally honest person and you want to get fired quickly, when the executive says, I can't remember an eight-digit password, you can say, you know, I'm going to have to write a letter to the board of directors saying apparently they hired a CEO that's a complete moron. How could you possibly not remember that? And then that comes back to fun, right? I'm now at an age and at a point in my career where I can say things like that to people because my career is winding down anyway. So if I, if I want to go out with the most epic bang ever, I could, you know, I, I, by the way, I actually do say things like that to very senior executives of big banks and brokerages and stuff. I am a real jerk to these people. Why? Because they've been getting away with crap for way too long. We collectively have been letting them get away with that. I'll give you an example of one. I was talking to a guy who is a, a CSO for a big bank that has, I think it's almost a half a million endpoints, and we were talking about endpoint security. And I had suggested that they might want to actually control their runtime environment using some kind of whitelisting or something to at least lock down the systems that don't need a dynamic software loadout. And then the systems that do need a dynamic software loadout, i.e. the ones that are getting malware all the time, those could be on a separate network. You could just divide it into you know, the screwed and the unscrewed and then monitor the screwed people differently from the unscrewed people. And he said, I swear, he said it would be hard. And I went, hmm, iPhone. And he said, yeah, it's one of the sixes. I have one of those, except mine's got platinum coating on it. But, but I said, iPhone, right? Apple shipped, what was it, 24 million whitelisted devices in one day? It's not hard. You're just lazy. Okay. I say things like that to people. It's fun, right? Of course, he's got a Ferrari and I don't. But all right. <laughs> Honestly, it's good for me not to have a Ferrari. I'd probably kill myself if I had one of those things. Okay, so this is an example of a metric. You could, I, I could actually do this entire talk off of this one slide, and I have. 
but it's really boring. Um, this is the poverty line, and you can learn everything that you need to know about building metrics off of this one metric here. Does anyone here know how the poverty line metric was created? Nope. See, nobody does. I didn't either when I started. I was trying to come up with a critical metric that gets used a lot because I knew that underlying it was probably a whole great big gobsmacking ton of BS, and I was right. So the way this was created was back during the Dust Bowl, during the Depression. Um, there was a, a, a young lady who worked for the Department of Agriculture who was trying to figure out how bad things were. And what she did is she figured out, based on the caloric input intake of a farm worker, the weekly caloric requirements for a farm worker, she then went to the store and came up with a bunch of hypothetical menus for what somebody in that social class might eat. So let's say you've got 50, well, they're a farm worker, so they need 2,200 calories per day. So she came up with six menus for, for 2,200 cal, 2, calories per day, went to the store and costed them out. Oh, so you got bacon, you got beans, you got rice, you got this, you got that, you got this. The other thing, it's going to all cost $5. So if that person is not making an average of $5 per day, which comes out to 35 bucks per week, they're below the poverty line, which means that they cannot serve, they cannot feed themselves, right? That, what relevance does that have to today, right? We have to do some kind of conversion factor into cappuccino, uh, mocha lattes, and, and um, you know, pizza, right? Um, which is, you know, which is fine, right? But it's actually not a bad metric. But what happened, of course, is it immediately became politicized. Why did it become politicized? It became politicized because it tells a story. It tells whether the country as an eco overall economy and the working class, whether the country is doing well or not, right? And of course, there's a, there's a bunch of problems with that. If you wanted to assume it was the working class, what you should probably do is factor the 1% out. Well, what would happen if you factored the 1% out? If you factored the 1% out, the people below the poverty line would double instantly on the average, right? How do you calculate this stuff? Um, so, so this is just a fairly simple example of how it goes. One of the things I like about it is it comes back to a certain distance. It sort of stops mysteriously around 1969 which is when it started, uh, this particular version of the chart, it should really go back to the 1930s, right? And what that would show is a steady, steady ramp of fantastic progress, which brings me to a critical point about lying about charts. Anytime you're looking at a chart or a metric of a chart, the first thing you should do is look at the axes, and you should see whether the axes are grounded in zero. If you're looking at a pie chart, someone's lying to you. I'll tell you about that later. But um, um, okay, so if you ask, if you run into an executive who asks for a pie chart, here's how you should look at them. I'm gonna try to emulate my friend's 12-year-old daughter. <sighs> okay, so if somebody asks you for a pie chart, just go. <sighs> and they go, why did you just flip your hair like a 12-year-old girl? And he goes, you're so stupid. <laughs> I think I actually did a really good imitation. She she'd be cheering if she was here. Um, and, and the reason is because a pie chart just shows you a unit slice of time. It doesn't show you, you know, a long thing. But so the thing is, if your if stuff goes off of your axis, you have to wonder why did they particularly pick 1969? Probably because this chart was probably made during an election year. Yeah. Um, I, there's a book I highly recommend. By the way, I'm going, to make a, I'm going to make a blanket statement here. If I ever recommend a book to you, I have Random's Law on book recommendations made while giving conference talks, and this is how it works. If I recommend a book to you, you go to Amazon, you buy the book, you do not like the book. Find me, contact me. I'm very easy to find. Punch my name into Google, you'll get my cell phone number. Call me at 4 o'clock in the morning and say, that book you recommended, I hate it. I'll say thank you for waking me up. But send it to me, put it in a box and send it to me, I will refund you your money. Because if in the strange circumstance that this has ever happened, which it has never happened, but in the strange circumstances you find that book not valuable, you are clearly clueless and I will find somebody who will appreciate that book. And you get my 15 bucks. Okay, so the book I'm talking about is Daryl Huff's How to Lie with Statistics. D-A-R-R-E-L-L -L, Huff with beautiful illustrations by, I forget his name. You can get on Amazon, it's about 15 bucks, doesn't have complex math. It's a beautiful book, it's brilliant. You can give it to your 12-year-old daughter so that when your 12-year-old daughter watches the upcoming elections, she'll go, he just lied, right? It's a brilliant book and it shows you all the ways that people lie with statistics. You will be unable to watch mainstream media um, afterwards because you'll see all the things. So there's like the fallacy of the, the, the missing, um, actually, does this one have it? Um, no, it doesn't, actually, right? They went all the way down to zero here. 
right? But one of the things that you could do if you were trying to lie with statistics is cut things off at 10%, which has the effect of visually magnifying the fluctuation, which makes the chart look like it's going up and down more. And then I pick the left-hand side for when the Republicans are in office, so it makes them look like crap, right? It, it's complete nonsense, of course. It's dishonest, but uh, anyway. So, so this is a really useful one. One of the other things, though, that, you know, kind of back to the whole issue about metrics is... Um, the way that it's calculated has been changed over and over and over and over again since I can't remember her name first laid this metric down. Now it's adjusted for inflation, it's adjusted for changes in the workplace. Nowadays you're below the poverty line if you can't afford internet service, I'm making that up. Um, which puts all of us in rural Pennsylvania automatically below the poverty line because Verizon sucks. Um, but. Uh, They've changed the way that it's factored. And one of the interesting things if you produce a long-term important metric like this is you're going to have to be able to explain how you factor and refactor it and how the new changes are back-propagated across your old metric. And so here's how you do that. I'm just going to tell you right up front. What you do is you keep your metric the old way and you keep your metric the new way. And if your metric is more or less good, what you're going to see is that the new way should tend to reveal more or less the same stuff as your old one. Or there's something wrong with your new metric, or there's something wrong with your old metric. Right? Very simple. I'll give you an example of a metric that I actually did use to use. I ran one of Digital Equipment Corporation's small handful of internet uh, connections back in the late 1980s when I first started building firewalls. And we justified that T1 line, which was expensive in those days, like 1200 bucks a month. We justified that T1 line in terms of that we were outreaching to customers. And so what we did is we came up with a metric for customer outreach. And that was in terms of how many emails we pushed into and out of the firewall and how many FTPs were done from customers pulling documentation and stuff like that through the firewall. And so that, you know, that was actually a pretty good metric. And so we just showed that what you'd expect was a kind of a steady ramp as that internet thing started to, to get more and more interesting. Well, a lot of the stuff was UCP based, but that's another whole story. You may remember UCP? Yeah, okay. Jeez, I'm getting old. Um, but anyway, uh, <clears throat> so uh, that would be a great metric, and what I could do is I could show how it kind of went up, and then it suddenly went through the floor around 1995, right? Now, what I would do is if I was counting in terms of bandwidth, which is what I was counting, I was counting in terms of data that we were sending out, um, that was probably not the best metric. So I, shifted I would have shifted over to customer contact, and then I would have started to factor in web hits, and then I would have been right back to kind of about where I was, right? And if I'm being honest, what I would do is I'd have a little asterisk in 1995, or I would show you the numbers, and then I'd show you the combined line, right? So I might say, you know, UECP traffic, FTP traffic, and web traffic. And you can see around 1995, the web traffic would come and jump up off the screen, UECP would go down through the toilet. And then I would have showed also well, I would have showed a really important thing. I would have showed that we were on the ball about catching that internet thing, that, that HTTP thing in time, right? Or what I might have showed is I might have showed that the, 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 that the HTTP thing, we completely missed the ball on that, <laughs> right? We didn't actually set up a website until 2000. I'm making up numbers here. And then I would show that we completely missed the ball, right? That's back to the fire me if I'm a marketing guy thing. Okay. so. How do you establish a relevant metric? How do you come up with something that is relevant to you? Clue number one, don't ask your boss. Don't do that. The other thing you don't want to do is you don't want to ask for what are the top 10 metrics I should keep. Right? Since I started publishing stuff about metrics, I have a steady flow of journalists who email me. And, and their deadline's always next Wednesday, by the way, which is really annoying. If we all just drag our feet and tell all journalists I need at least a month on any deadline, we've got to condition these guys. But anyway, so they all go, I, I'm doing an article next week, and I basically want you to write it for me, and um, it's about metrics, and so just tell me what are the top ten metrics I should keep. Hmm. And I, you know, I want to mess with those guys and go, well, you should keep your widget production line results. Because I'm assuming, right, I mean, the last person I talked to was Acme Widget, and so it should be just as relevant to you as it is to them. Right? No. So there is actually no top 10 metrics you should keep. There isn't. There simply isn't. Um, there's, so this is a big problem for vendors, by the way, because what vendors can do is they can provide the engines that collect the underlying data that you need. Everything that they do should collect the underlying data that you might need to build some kind of useful metric. But they can't run it up because they don't know your business. Unless you guys are all in business doing the same thing, they cannot possibly know. 
comes back to now, asking your boss. If you go to your boss and say, what metric should I keep? Your boss, if they're a jerk, should turn around, actually if they're honest and a jerk, should turn and go, well, that's what I hired you to figure out. Because when you say, I don't know what metrics I should be keeping, you've just said, I don't know what my job is. Your job is what your metrics measure. So if you don't know what your metrics measure, you don't know what success and failure in your job are, which is kind of like hoisting the fire, fire me flag, which is, you know, it's okay. Um, do that if you want to, right? We talked about how the poverty line was established. So how do you build these things? Start with the question, right? The first question I like is, what is it I do? Here's a, here's a good way of starting this. I'm going to kind of game through it. Let's say you're the head of the incident response team for Acme Widgets. Hey, I'm guessing your metrics have something to do with incident response. You might go so far, after you've nailed down your metrics about incident response, you might go so far as to couple how your incident response process interfaces with the Acme Widget, widget production process. Now you've migrated from being the head of the incident response process to doing what the CSO should be doing, right? The CSO should be talking about how the incident response process has impacted negatively or positively the widget production line. That's the CSO's job down in the trenches. You're just talking about how fast the incident response process can, can or, or should be running. So I'll give you some fake examples of that, right? One of the things that might happen in a meeting, imagine, that somebody from one of the business units proposes to do something. I don't know, Acme Widgets, it's not a proposal, it's just, it's something that's going to happen, right? So you're in this meeting and they tell you, we just also acquired Lenovo, Lenovo Widget Inc. Or no, let's, let's do better. We're opening a Chinese subsidiary to make widgets in Shenzhen, okay? And then that's, that's fine. This is not something that you have input into. It's going to happen, right? So what you might do is you might say, that's great. Well, I'll get back to you in a week with some projections about how that's going to how that's going to impact our incident response process. I'm the guy who does incident response, and I'm going to have a whole bunch of new problems. We're going to magnify those problems. We're going to have we're going to lose some problems. We're going to take on some problems. Well, so one of the questions is, are we going to still have our existing computer systems, or are we going to move our IP infrastructure to Shenzhen? Am I going to be doing incident response in Shenzhen as well as incident response in, De in Detroit? where our main widget production line is. You tell me, right? Now you're going to show right away when you start asking those questions that you understand something about how your job is connected to the business. You're, you're also just doing your job. That's how, that's how metrics get done. Another thing to think about as, a, as a, a sneaky tactic, I don't necessarily recommend doing this, but while you're starting to build out your, your metrics program, it's not a bad idea to just collect kind of random facts about what it is that you do. Um, I have a friend who collects random facts about stuff that he doesn't even do, and he just has all that stuff, and just keep that at your fingertips. And so when you come into the meeting, this can be really, really fun. So you come into the meeting, and somebody's, you know, somebody's talking about something. You say, "We think it'd be great if we could add some, um, if we could add some basic block and block and filter rules into the F5 load balancers." And one of the guys from the networking department says, "That's going to slow things down too much." And you can go, "Well, that's really weird," because I had my friend over there who runs. The, all the websites for Warner Brothers tell me about the performance load on his F5s when he added filtering to it, and the answer was it doesn't really affect it at all. So where did you come up with this idea it's going to make it slower? Right? It's the old thing about like if you're, a, if you're the, uh, the guy with a gun at a knife fight, if you're the guy at the meeting who actually can reach into your pocket and come out with real pieces of information, it's really hard to argue with real pieces of information. Um, and so just keep a few of those if you can. So that means knowing everything that you can about as many data points about what's going on inside of your operation as possible, right? One thing that's fun. So imagine you're in this meeting, you start talking about whitelisting, and then you go, oh, we couldn't possibly whitelist 500,000 machines. And then you could go, well, we only actually have 400,000 machines. How did you know that? Oh, because, you know, I'm the guy who runs the Nessus scans. We, we know how many machines we have on the network. Don't you? Right. You're the IT guy. You're supposed to know how many machines you have. Don't you know that? Uh, it's kind of interesting. So start with the question and then work back. What is it I do? And then eventually you can work to the next question is, why is it that I do what I do? But think in terms of your unit of measure. The, the, whole, the whole trick here is, what is the unit of measure for what it is that I do? 
Imagine that you're the head of incident response and you come up with your own unit of measurement. It's the response on. And you know, response on is the number of incidents that you can respond to in five minutes. I don't know, I'm just making this up, right? But so then you can rate your incident response team at, at 0.3 response ons per hour. I don't know. I mean, it sounds incredibly bogus. It is incredibly bogus. I don't recommend getting bogus, but think in terms of what your unit of measurement it is. If you're, but, but so, so, so kind of back to this mythical incident response organization, right? It could be that the thing that is, a, is your key business problem in your incident response process Process is doing more incidents faster. It could be that your key unit of measurement is doing more depth than you're currently doing on your incidents. It could be that your key unit of measure is having less manpower resources involved in your incident responses. So there's three completely different units of measurement, and I don't know which one's your problem, right? Now, if you're, if you're trying to establish a metrics program and you're the boss of the incident management process, what are you going to do? Measure all three and then figure out which one's most interesting to you, right? Measure all three. Once you've gone to the trouble to measure all three of them, measure all three of them in perpetuity. Why? Because you may find out over time that two of them correlate. It could be that, it could be that your, your response rate correlates with your staffing. Maybe you need more people. Maybe you need fewer people. Maybe you need better training, right? And that's, that's the part where you get from the data to the story that you want to tell. We need better people. We need training. We need more automation. I don't know what your problem is, but you're going to learn that as you, as you go through that. So another way of doing that is to build a list of what's quantifiable inside your process. I guarantee, I guarantee you, I won't give you a money back guarantee like I will on the, the How to Lie with Statistics book, though. But I guarantee you, if you actually do some process analysis about what it is that you do, you will find places where you can do things a little bit more efficiently. And there's, there's a variety of different models you can use for this. Um, I'm, I, I do kind of what I call a modified fishbone chart, which is essentially a sloppy flow chart. Well, we do this, and then we do that, and then we do this, and we do that. And then between the two nodes, between the nodes, as things move around in this flow chart kind of thing, it's not really a flow chart, it's more like a directed acyclic graph, but um, as we're moving from the root to the branches, between each of the decision points, what you want to do is you want to know two things. You might think of more stuff, but, but two things is good. One is the amount of clock time it takes to do, and two is the amount of staff time it takes to do. And those are different things, right? Clock time and staff time. Um, and you know, you might you might learn some really interesting stuff. So our incident response process, right? And this is actually drawn from a real experience I had that was incredibly painful. Um, but so, you know, your incident response process, we have a, 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 you know, an incident drops in, and then we have a WTF meeting. And the WTF meeting is, you know, two senior staff people for an hour. And we go, WTF, right? And then from that, we either forward things to IT for re-imaging, which takes five minutes. And then, um, oh, I'm gonna try to bookmark that and come back to that point. Or the other thing we do is we need more information and then we ask IT a bunch of questions, and then we have a WTF 2.0 meeting, and then we go further down back into our triage loop, right? So one of the things that I realized when I started diagramming this out in this IR process that I was looking at is like, why do we have, why do we have, 90% of the time we have two WTF meetings, and 100% of the time we ask IT the same questions. We always ask them for what was what was in the syslogs and the NetFlow data during this during the time of this hypothetical incident. So if we just go back to management, this is one of those things where I almost did want to come back and say, you should fire me. I'm stupid. Right? Because basically what we needed to do is we need to get a programmer for one day, a systems administrator, to script a bunch of stuff so that when we had an incident. It did the 10 questions that we always asked IT, collected them into a zip file, and attached them into a wiki in the incident response process so that we didn't have to ask. So at the WTF meeting, we were already informed with all the information that we needed. So we merged the WTF 1.0 meeting and the WTF 2.0 meeting and left that three hours of waiting for IT to get pissed off at us for groveling through the firewall logs one more time. Right. So that's an example of what I'm talking about. When you start building these fishbone or flow or whatever it is, however, whatever model it is you want to use, of what it is that you do, just doing basic business process analysis, there's quite a good chart, there's quite a good chance that you're going to discover that you suck. 
and you need to fix a few things. Or you might discover that you're absolutely fantastic, in which case you can say that. Write a little report, send it up the chain. So we did a process analysis of our workflow, and we've discovered that there's no place we can optimize it any further. That's great, right? Because when you plant that intellectual stake in management's mind, then one of the things when they said that we're gonna, you know, we're gonna push this out to, we're gonna, put, we're gonna open up an office someplace else, you can say, because we've optimized our incident response process to the point where we can't really improve it, I can tell you if you triple our incident response rate, you're gonna to have to triple our staffing. And you're, not, you're not being confrontational there. You're not saying, no, don't do it. You're just saying, we've done a cost benefit. We've done the cost analysis. And now you can apply multiplication technology and you can do the cost benefit analysis for Ari Boy. Right? It just works. Um, so you want to ask yourself, oh, the other point that I wanted to make uh, that I bookmarked is sometimes your flow is going to go off of your chart. That's not a bad thing. If the flow goes off of your chart, what you want to do is put on your chart at the point where the flow resumes on your chart. If it goes off your chart and it never comes back, you can put a big green smiley face because now it's all somebody else's problem. You've won. As soon as you make it someone else's problem permanently, you've won. But what if it's not someone else's problem permanently? What if it goes to IT and then it comes back, right? Now what you do is when it comes back, you have another touch point where you can measure clock time. You no longer have staff time because you don't know how much time IT spent on that thing. But let's just imagine we have this scenario in the incident response process. You get a machine that's malware infected. Infected, and part of our flow is that we forward it to IT to get the machine reimaged, and it comes back on our desk. Uh, it comes back on our desk six months later, right? We put on the chart. Look at this. We run this part of the process in four hours, and then IT takes six months to do this piece, and then it comes back on our on our chart, and we spend one hour. I think the people in IT are spending too much time farting around on the web or something, because it shouldn't take them. Actually, you don't want to make that analysis. What you want to do is you want to walk into management with that chart and say, we did some basic process analysis of our incident response procedures, and this is what it looks like. And here's where we spend our time. And then we have this great big long tent pole where it goes into another organization. We don't know what's happening. But we're beholden to that particular tent pole, right? So you can illustrate this very well. Now, in that case, it's not really a statistic. It's a result of a process analysis, but in order to do that process analysis, you want to have that process analysis bolstered with some real statistics. So one of the things that you can do, if you've got a staff of people, you've got minions, you summon all your minions together, and you say, minions, today we will not have beatings as usual. We're going to do something a little bit different. This is how I talk to my minions anyway. And they all go, damn, we love the beatings. But um, at least that's how things work in Marcus fantasy land. Um, uh, but what you basically say is, look, in order to protect you, support you, and make your jobs and your lives easier, I need to know what you spend your time doing. I really don't need to know how much time you spend on eBay during office hours or any of that kind of stuff. But we're building a process flow chart, and I'd like you to help me fill this in with accurate information. So one of the things I'd like to know, you can anonymize it if you want, but just keep notes about what you spend your time doing. And I'm not talking like time card where it's associated project. I want time card where it's associated with task. So if you, if you put on your time card that you spent six hours pestering the folks in IT for firewall logs, I need to know that because that way I can go to the carpet and, and fight to pull that six hours down if that's what's killing you, right? If it's not killing you, maybe I won't fight that particular issue. But unless I have that information, I cannot protect you. I cannot make your job better. And the other problem is, because the people in the IT department went to one of Marcus's talks on how to keep metrics, they're pulling the same trick on us. So we have to pull it on them first, or they're going to get that stake planted in management's mind. Right? It's the same thing. This is how do you weaponize executive management? Right? Other things you want to think about with those quantities, right? If things go up and down, we don't have to worry about fancy math and computer security. Things either get better or they get worse. It's very simple. So things are going up or down. The bug count rises or it falls, whatever. You know, the number of pieces of code you push through QA rises or falls. Um, it's very simple. So which is good, what's a good direction? Some basic chartology, don't ever put good stuff and bad stuff on the same chart with the same axes. Break them out into two charts. Pixels are cheap. Right? So you don't want to have like a red line that says, you know, as, as it goes up, it's bad. And you don't want to have your incident rate on the same 
chart as the number of pieces of code you push through QA, unless they're correlated somehow. Um, and then, how do you know what constitutes a significant movement? Um, don't go there. That's my advice. Calculating what is a significant movement is really, really difficult. That's the reason that you want to show um, basic time charts over time, right? I don't know what in the heck happened in 1983. 19, 1983 was a mini recession. Oh, 81, was that 79? Anyway, I don't know what happened, but something interesting happened, right? We don't have to go any further. I don't need fancy math. I can just, I mean, if I was presenting this as a meeting and you guys were all a bunch of executives, I could go, the thing happened there. And that, we're, we're done. I don't need to, right? And now we can get into root cause analysis of the thing and what it means, but I don't have to do anything fancy on my chart to try to say this is our normal thing rate versus our abnormal thing rate. So don't worry about that. And that's why you want to measure these things all over time. That is point number one, why somebody who comes in with a pie chart is an idiot. Um, because if you come in with a pie chart, consider, I flip forward, consider that time variant chart as a sequence of pie charts consisting of two slices, right? It's an infinite sequence of pie charts consisting of two slices. So what someone has done when they give you a pie chart is they've thrown away all of the information except for that one slice in time. And if I'm an executive and you bring me a pie chart, I assume you picked the one slice in time that makes something look better or worse than it actually is, and I ask for the full data set. And if it turns out that you actually did pick the one slice in time that makes things look better or worse than you did, your career with me is over because you told me a lie. I don't mind people who are sneaky, underhanded, malicious, conniving, and manipulative as long as they say, I'm going to try to manipulate you. I'm okay with that. Just be honest, right? And the problem is when I see a pie chart, I immediately suspect someone's either stupid or dishonest, and I don't want to work with stupid or dishonest people. Same thing, by the way, if an executive asks for a pie chart. So one of the things we do is we collect lots and lots of data points in our products and allow you to build stuff from that, uh, which is actually kind of, I mean, that's really, really necessary, right? I'm going to give you an example of how that sort of thing plays itself out. You want to be able to, you want to be able to look at your network and be able to see, um, you know, well, okay, one of, the, one of the, the, the coolest bits of kung fu I saw on that was a friend of mine who does uh, security for Columbia University. And basically what they did is they plotted out and they came in with a metric. They took it into senior management and they said, this is the, this is the incident response rate among machines that the faculty manage. And this is the incident response rate among machines that are managed by IT under configuration management. Now, one of them is a line that's like this, and the other one's kind of a straight line. We're done, right? There are not as many faculty managed machines there anymore. Because you can, right, you can subdivide things and you can come in and pull those metrics out of something. You need some kind of engine that's going to do the underlying collection. Um, it doesn't matter what it is. The problem, of course, is with all the products. The products, they don't know how you're going to use the numbers. So you want to, you want to look for something that's going to collect as much numbers as possible. I know you guys are, you guys are talking software development here. Um, but you've got the same issues. You've got you know, flaw counts, code complexity metrics. You've got you know, stuff like that. So, so one of the things I might look at is, do I have, do I have uh, a correlation between the complexity of the code and the flaw count of the code? Do I have a correlation between Joe, Fred, Anne, and Jane and the bug rate? I mean, it kind of sucks to think about it that way. But if I come in and I've got a, and I've got a, a, a way of tracking who coded the bug to the frequency of bugs, then I can actually come in with a metric that says this individual coded four times more bugs than anybody else. Whenever we had a bug fix, I kept track of who had coded the original bug. Kind of sucks to do that. You go sort of negative. But the way you can handle that with your team is you come in and say, yeah, we're tracking bugs. We're tracking bugs on an individual basis. The reason we're doing that is because the people who write the less buggy code the fastest are going to get a bonus. The people who write the more buggy code are going to get to get to have a new profile on monster.com. Think how nice that is. It's for your own benefit. You get to reinvent yourself as a Walmart reader. Um, okay. So in order to keep your metrics relevant, don't change your algorithm constantly. If you change your algorithm constantly, you can't get those kinds of time variant graphs. So one of the one, one of the things to do there is if you if you are producing time variant graphs and you're changing your data sets, um, keep the old one as well as the new one, 
right? And after five years, if the old one and the new one look more or less the same, well, question one, why did you bother computing a new one? And then two, uh, two is yeah, it's okay to it's okay to discard whichever one of them you think is is no longer quite as relevant, right? But once you've gone to the trouble of computing it, we're talking very small amounts of data at this point. It's just a resolved number, or or a big GIF, so you may as well keep this stuff a big JPEG. Um, okay, so uh, let's always look at how you can build more data on top of other data. Back to your underlying question of what it is that we do. I'll give you one of my favorite ones. I, I was talking with some people on a conference call about six months ago, and we were we were talking about some metrics that they were trying to build, and they were having problems with their their IT department. And so we came up with this metric, which is really fun. So I'm trying to figure the best way to explain this one. So they every time that they told IT that they had a critical security fix, they would start clock going. During the time that the clock for that fix was going, if they had an incident related to the root cause of the thing that they had told IT about, they produced a chart basically saying, of all the problems that we had, this is the percentage that if IT had just fixed the damn stuff we told them to, we wouldn't have. So we had to run the incident response process 36 times in the last four months, more than we would have had to run them if IT had been fixing things in only a week. Isn't that a cool metric? Right? So that's an example of constructing things on top of things. Now, somebody might complain about that and say you're extrapolating a little bit too much. You're like a, you're like a politician during an election year. You're, you're just going wild with these, these fictional numbers, right? So the way that you get around that is a very simple thing, which is you expose your argument and expose your algorithm and then plug the numbers in. This is how you can avoid a metrics quagmire. So basically what, what I did, when I, so if I'm explaining this, I go, okay, so what we do here, tell me, tell me anybody interrupt me if this doesn't sound right. So what we do here is whenever we tell IT about a, a critical security fix that needs to be made, we monitor when we told IT, and then anytime we run our incident response process, if we do a root cause analysis that it shows that it's related to one of the fixes that we recommended to IT, we charge it into this bucket, otherwise we charge it into that bucket. Does that sound good? And I see some of you in the room are nodding, because it does sound good. It's an honest metric. I don't know if it's a good metric, but it's an honest, it's an honest attempt at showing something through some numbers. And then I plug the numbers in and everybody's eyeballs fall out from the result. Once you've agreed on how we're going to reduce the data, when I plug the numbers in, it's already too late. So back to meeting Kung Fu, if you see somebody pulling that trick on you, you need to get them into quagmire over their scientific method before they get to plug the numbers in. Because the second they plug the numbers in, you know what's coming, right? It's like an asteroid headed at you. It, it, actually, there's nothing you can do about that. But um, you, need to, you need to start maneuvering before the numbers get plugged in, because after the numbers get plugged in, the only thing you can do is go, oh, that slide I should have stopped you on four slides ago. Let's go back there, which looks pretty weak. But that's your only maneuver left, because the only other thing you can do is call the person a liar and say, I don't believe you collected those numbers accurately. And then you are really screwed if you do that in a corporate context. You can do it if you're a politician because you, you probably are lying, right? I didn't know our economy was, was $60 trillion last year, really? Oh, I just pulled that one out of my backside. Um, okay, uh, so some other stuff. Don't tie it to financial models. Don't say this is going to cost us a million dollars or whatever. Tie it to something that executives understand. And there's another thing to think about, which is, now this is more of how to be manipulative, so I think it's possibly a little bit evil. I think it's okay to be manipulative as long as you tell someone I'm manipulating them. I will manipulate you. This talk is manipulation, right? I'm manipulating you. It's okay to be manipulative as long as you're not being sneaky about it, right? But if you're being sneaky about it, um, think about this thing called the Franklin effect. So Ben Franklin apparently had a guy, right? So Ben Franklin was this blogger back in 1775 or so, right? And he had this blog that he posted and he kept getting good blog wars with this other blogger whose name I forget. And finally, Franklin decided he was just going to pawn the guy. So what he did is he showed up at the guy's doorstep. He actually waited until a day when it was raining, apparently. And so he shows up at this guy's doorstep, dripping wet, wet all bundled up. And he says, you know, I know, I know we have blog wars, and you said you'd kill me if you ever saw me. But I understand that you have a copy of this particular book that I would really love to be able to read. 
And I'm wondering if even though you despise and loathe me, if I could sit someplace and read that because I, I can't get it any place else. And of course, suddenly, now Franklin is this guy's guest. Well, first off, the guy would had to deal with the cognitive dissonance of being a complete jerk and kicking away Ben Franklin from his doorstep while he's dripping. Go, go back out into the rain, thou dog, right? Um, you can't do that. So you invite the person in. Oh, here, let me take your coat, your wet. Would you like some tea? Oh, I'd love some tea, right? Now he's your guest. Ten minutes later, Franklin completely turned the guy, and the guy was posting, you know, blog fellatio about how wonderful Franklin was for the rest of his life. You can do exactly this kind of trick. So, so, so how did I get there? When you're, if you're tying things to a financial model, what you've done is completely computed everything out for people. If you leave them enough information so they can do their own extrapolation, they do their own extrapolation. They have this brief little zing of pleasure because they got to feel smart for a second, and now they own part of that process. So if you come in and you say, you know, um, our incident response process consumes five full-time engineers who are all senior you know, they're all senior employees. We'd like to reduce, you know, we'd like to bring in more people, but I have a plan so we can bring in less senior people, you know, and then, you know, you can figure out the budget from that. The executive's going to figure out the budget from that. The fact that they figured out the budget from that buys them just a little bit more into your argument. That is manipulation. That's evil. It's how business is frequently done. I don't like to play that way, but if you do more power to you, I just don't ever want you behind me. Um, Anyway, so that's, that's one piece. The other one, of course, is avoiding the, the metrics quagmire. Um, always tie things to existing facts. That's another way of manipulating cognitive bias in a good way. By tying things to exi existing facts, you make things more plausible. That's simply a fact. The way that our brains are wired, it's why we have, it's why we have cognitive biases like survivorship bias and, and Dunning-Kruger effect. When somebody throws out a piece of information, and you recognize it as a piece of truth, you buy in just a little bit more because our brains are basically a great big recognizer algorithm. When you see something that triggers a match, it gives you a little shot of pleasure. That, by the way, is the reason why music works on us, right? We start listening to the rhythm and we go, oh, it's going to drop now, and it does, and you go, yes! You know, it's like the fantastic drop in some of these techno music, and you feel it, and you get this jolt of pleasure because you predicted the drop correctly. That's all this stuff is. It's just manipulation. Okay, I'm almost done. A couple more points. Um, you can, this is something we don't do a very good job of in, in, in computing in general, and I, I, I wish we could um, for, for a lot of reasons. Um, I'm trying to get some people I know in the, in the community, specifically around endpoint protection, to try to, uh, to try to do some of these kinds of things. So like I was talking to a guy the other day who's got a half a million endpoints under his purview, and I was going, you know, can you do something like identify a thousand endpoints, and if a thousand endpoints run the way IT runs them, a thousand endpoints run without antivirus, a thousand endpoints run with application whitelisting, a thousand endpoints run with a script blocker and an ad blocker, and uh, people are only doing stuff with non-privileged accounts. And then measure the outcomes on those four or five thousand different communities as a kind of a, a public health study. This is how we do things in, in medicine, right? We measure the outcomes of different isolated communities, the people who smoke cigarettes versus the people who don't smoke cigarettes. And then you measure their outcomes and you go, these guys are dying of cancer at a rate 25 times more than the other one. There might be something going on here, right? It's not very difficult to do that. We don't do this very well at all. I'm not quite sure why. I think it's because computer people tend to try to think in terms of consistent solutions. And consistent solutions tend to be ubiquitous. So we. I, I have this all the time. I talk, to, I talk to people and they go, you know, you should control your runtime. That means doing something like either putting your systems under tight configuration management or doing whitelisting or something like that. It's ridiculous to have people installing software unless they need to. And then they always go, yeah, well, people need to. And we go, good. Isolate the community that needs to from the community that doesn't need to and expect different outcomes. Measure those outcomes differently. All right? I guarantee you, if you want to do a really great metric in your organization, if you can do a root cause analysis of 
of security incidents on endpoints where people had people had local local administrator versus where it was centrally managed through configuration management, you will measure different outcomes. I guarantee it. I predict that you'll find that the systems where people have local administrator have inferior outcomes to the ones where they don't. If you ever see it work out differently, there's a great paper that you could write about it. But it, it could happen, right? I mean, purple monkeys could come flying out of my backside, too. Um, but, but for some reason, this is considered really difficult, right? So one of the things you can do is you can say, let's measure these outcomes variably. Now, if you do that, you want to be honest with yourself and say, because in some cases, we're actually selecting a particular community that we're going to measure separately. Now you've got sampling bias, and you can't really generate... Um, you can't really generate a good metric from that. So what do I mean by that? And we, we actually did this at one organization. Um, uh, it turned out that this one organization I was talking to had um, literally thousands of desktop machines that were kind of in an open configuration for office temps. So they'd hire an office temp, the office temp would come in and, and, and do Microsoft Office-y stuff and send email and, and surf the web and buy stuff on eBay or whatever. Whatever it was that the office temp did all day, right? Print stuff out or whatever. Um, and and we, we kind of went, you know, do you actually have any, do, do the office temps actually have any need to run, run PowerShell? Uh, and install their own applications. Of course they don't. All right, so why don't you try configuring it so that that population doesn't have that particular ability. And sure enough, the outcomes changed dramatically. That little tweak took their number of incidents per year 50% of what it was before, right? Um, <clears throat> I'm getting the wrap-up flag, and that's good, because I'm, I'm almost done, right? But so another example, this is a question Alex Hutton likes to ask, which is, what is my riskiest business unit? Great question. You should be able to answer that, right? It's going to mean being able to subdivide things into business units, which means you've got some interesting abstractions there. How do you track risk? How do you define risk? You might define risk in terms of incidents per per unit time or something like that, um, tied back to tied back to business units or whatever. Um, and so we we ran across this one organization that did that, and it turned out that that they had a huge problem with one business unit was something like 70% of their security incidents. What the hell? One business unit, 70% of the problems. You know who it was? Human resources. And we went to the human resources people like a good scientist would do and go, okay, we need more data. What's going on here? And they're like, well, our job is we're supposed to click on everything we get. Of course we get lots of malware. Ah. Mega face palm, right? So we basically went back, and this is one of those I should be fired kind of reports, right? So we went back to executive management and said, um, we'd like four iPads that can exist outside of the perimeter that HR can read all the attachments on. And you should fire us because it's going to resist, it's going to reduce our, our, it's going to reduce our security incident rate by probably about 70%. And I should have figured this out years ago. So I won't be angry if you fire me, because that really is pretty epic stupid, right? So anyway, so that's a, a metrics kind of almost win. So you can hypothesize something, and then make a small change, and then see what the outcome is, measure the outcome, and make recommendations, right? The battle of narratives, you want to be the person with the gun with the knife fight, and that means bringing in some kind of information. Um, so critical recommendations are done, right? Start collecting the stuff you've got. Look at the stuff that you've got. Go top down and bottom up. Top down is what is it that we do and then design things down. What information do we need to collect about what it is that we do? And then bottom up is what information do we already have that we can slot into that question about what it is that we do? And that'll help us start building a framework that's going to allow us to figure out what further information that we need to collect. Examine it, figure out what you can generate metrics from, start doing that. Uh, if I may be zen for just one moment, you know, what's the best, when's the best time to plant a mighty oak tree? 50 years ago. When's the best time, second best time to plant a mighty oak tree? Tomorrow. Right, so do that. Um, don't go overboard on the statistics. You'll never need to do fancy statistics on any of this stuff. And then always, uh, always favor comparative metrics over absolutes. And the reason that I like to do the reason I like to do comparatives over absolutes, this is just a small data point, is, is it becomes, it becomes self-normalizing, right? If I'm talking to somebody in this room and I say, I, I had um, 
250 security incidents last month. I told you nothing interesting except the number 250. If I told you I'm Bank of America and I had 250 security incidents, if I told you I'm eBay and I had 250 security incidents, or if I told you, well, random.com is just really bad security and my five machines at home had 250 incidents, right? You don't know. But if I come in and I say, well, I have an average of two incidents, two incidents per desktop per year, it still doesn't necessarily apply to you. But now we've gotten that whole question of what's the factoring right off the table, you don't have to worry about it. So that's what I had to say. Um, uh, and, um, you know, go ahead. If you're not familiar with GraphJam, I highly recommend GraphJam, by the way. It's kind of the antidote to boring metrics and statistics. It's like weaponized PowerPoint, very, very funny. Um, and also, the, the CTO of OKCupid okay used to do a blog where he would troll for, troll for correlations in their gigantic data set, which is really cool. And it turns out that chart was, if your significant other's Twittering rate goes up, they're more likely to leave you. <laughs>